Hey guys, this is Dr. Aaron Ernst. Thank you so much for joining us for episode four of Q&A with Dr. A. So excited that you're joining us this evening. We've been getting a lot of really, really good questions. And so I'm really looking forward to expanding your horizons in all different areas. Don't forget this airs every single Thursday at seven o'clock as a new episode and you get to be the script writer. So if you have a question for us, scroll down underneath this video and you'll find a link that you can click that brings you to our confidential contact portal and you can ask any question that you have in regards to health and we get to answer them on this show every week. Also, don't forget every Saturday at 10 a.m. I do a radio show here in Charlotte on 1660 and also at 3 o'clock on WBT, which is 1110 a.m. or 99.3 FM. So you can join us for the Ask Dr. Ernst show for that each week. And um, what I really, really like about today's questions is that we're, we're starting to get into some really, really specific ones. So hopefully you find this as a great seminar. It's a really good way to just learn what other people are asking because it may affect you or it may affect a family member or something to that effect. So of course, as we begin this, know that this is a rapid fire question, answer, question, answer, and off we go. First question says, uh, I saw online that there's a thyroid issue that can stem from Epstein-Barr virus. What is the understanding of this? And, and here's the thing. It is a direct connection between Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune form of thyroid conditions, and a potential previous infection with Epstein-Barr virus. So Epstein-Barr is connected to mononucleosis, which is known as the kissing disease. And so chances are most of us have gotten this, and we typically have this virus lying dormant with inside of us. But I see a significant correlation with clients and patients that I work with that have autoimmune thyroid conditions actually have an activation of Epstein-Barr. Now, the only way to know if this is happening is you have to be tested for Epstein-Barr virus. And it's a very simple blood test to just check the counts or the amounts of Epstein-Barr in your blood. And what we know is, is that when Epstein-Barr starts to climb or get reactivated, we tend to find a lot of thyroid conditions showing up around that time frame, specifically if it's an autoimmune thyroid. And that's partly because when a virus is running rampant within the body, the immune system starts to climb to go after the virus. And Epstein-Barr virus has a very similar mimicking issue with the thyroid gland. So that virus itself looks a lot like the thyroid proteins and components. So as the body is attacking Epstein-Barr, it's often also attacking the thyroid. And now if you're going to go treat Epstein-Barr virus and do it more from a natural or a holistic perspective, vitamin C, selenium, medicinal mushrooms, curcumin, zinc, these are all really, really good antivirals. And what's unique about this is a lot of people that have thyroid conditions will start taking selenium and start going, oh my gosh, my thyroid is doing great, my numbers look good. When in fact, what's probably happening is the selenium is actually kicking the Epstein-Barr virus out and the immune reaction calms down and then the thyroid works better by itself. So it could be actually that it's an Epstein-Barr virus infection, not a thyroid condition. So it is connected directly to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So that's a fantastic question. Next question says, is it good to be in ketosis for a long term? And listen, listen, this is a great question. We know short term that ketosis is fantastic for multiple things. What ketosis is, is it means that you're in a state of using a different fuel source than say sugar for energy. So there's something known as beta ketobutyrate, which is a type of a ketone body that is produced when you're fasting. Because your cells need something for energy, they typically will use sugar. So sugar is in the form of glucose, the cells are functioning, but as you fast, your, your glucose levels go down, so the cells start to say, hey, I need something. Well, what your body will do is it will burn fat for energy, and one of the byproducts of burning fat is a ketone body, and ketone bodies can actually energize the cells and give them a fuel source, very much like sugar, but it doesn't have the oxidation effects. So what are the benefits of being in ketosis? Well, first of all, you can lose weight. Second of all, there's been a lot of studies that show that when you're in ketosis, you can actually kill cancer cells and harmonize the body's hormones. So being in ketosis is fantastic for multiple things. They've even done studies that shows it works for epileptics and people that have neurological disorders like Parkinson's, dementia, and Alzheimer's. 
And part of that comes from, again, the brain can utilize ketone bodies for energy more so than any other cell within the body. So you can actually activate the brain by being in ketosis. So here comes the answer to the question. I think it's great to be in long-term ketosis, but you have to understand there are levels of ketosis. So it goes like this. If you're Ketone bodies measure zero when you're checking yourself with a blood stick or something to that effect, then you're not in ketosis at all. If you get to a 0.4, you're still at low, low levels, basically not in ketosis at all. As soon as you hit 0.5, you're entering into what we would call a low level state of ketosis. As soon as you hit 1.5 though, you enter what is known as low level nutritional ketosis which means you're starting to burn fat, you're starting to generate energy, but you're not technically into therapeutic ketosis yet. When you get to about a 2.5, now you're in what we would know as therapeutic ketosis. You're, you're killing cancer cells, you're activating brain functions, you're letting your bodies go through a fasting starvation state, you're basically regenerating tissue. When you get to be about 3.5, sometimes up to 4.5, you're in a low level of what's known as starvation ketosis. It's good to go there occasionally, but it's not good to stay there for a long period of time. You get to a five or a six or a seven, now you're in what's known as true starvation ketosis. Again, some of you may need to get into a starvation ketosis to let your body regenerate, but you don't wanna stay there for a long period of time at all. If you get to 50, 60, 70, 80, now you're into what's known as ketoacidosis, and that can be very detrimental for your health. In fact, it can actually lead to early death. So we have to really answer the question by saying, are there benefits of being in long-term, low-level nutritional ketosis? And the answer is yes. There was a study done in 2014 that was titled Long-Term Effects of Ketogenic Diet on the Body Composition and Bone Mineralization. They tested people who were in ketosis between 1.5 and 2.5 for a period of five years. So I would consider this long term. This is exactly what they said is their conclusion. Our data suggests that maintaining a ketotic diet for more than five years poses no major negative effects on body composition, bone mineral content, and bone mineral density. So in essence, they're saying there's nothing wrong with your body as far as how you compose yourself, fats, proteins, nutrients. Your bones won't get weak and you won't become mineral deficient. That right there to me shows you we should stay in a level of ketosis for a long period of time. But remember, we're not going to be pushing high levels of nutrient or therapeutic ketosis for a long period of time. Personally, I try to stay at least 0.5 to 1.5 all the time. Why? Because we want to kill cancer cells, we want to burn fat, and we want to prevent age-related decay of the brain. Can you explain the reason why we need to take digestive enzymes when we eat? And is this something that we have to do for the rest of our life? So here, here's the thing. To begin with, most of us are deficient in enzymes, and we can partly blame that on the industrialization of farming. Most enzymes come from plants. So when we eat plants, we get enzymes. Now our body also produces their own degree of enzymes. We have enzymes in our stomach, we have enzymes in our liver, we have enzymes in other places. So we can produce our own enzymes, but specifically when you eat foods that are high in enzymes, it helps you to digest them. There is this theory that of course acid reflux is too much acid within the stomach but that has been completely debunked because it's actually not enough acid in the stomach that causes the foods you eat to stay there for long periods of time and rot and produce organic acids that you burp up in reflux and feel acidic, but they're not actually hydrochloric acid acids. So what we now know is that you need to supplement hydrochloric acid for most people. Now you make hydrochloric acid by taking hydrogen and chlorine, and so most of you aren't drinking chlorine, so you're going to get the chlorine from your salts. Now the problem today is most medical doctors tell you don't eat salt, it causes all diseases known to man, and that is a complete lie. You actually do need a degree of salt within your diet because it's what helps you to produce hydrochloric acid. So the reason I'm a big fan of taking enzymes is, first of all, 
you're probably not eating all of your vegetables raw. You're probably cooking them so you're gonna denature the enzymes. Second, most people aren't eating enough vegetables and fruits anyway, so we're not getting enough enzymes in the first place. Third, most people have acid reflux or digestive issues with not enough hydrochloride, so we need to take the hydrochloride to get things going. So I recommend a product called Digestzyme. It's just one that I use that has hydrochloride and all of the different enzymes for fats and proteins and sugars so that when you eat your food, it's digested quicker, it gets into the smaller kind of uh, mineral nature, and you can absorb digested foods faster. So therefore, the stomach doesn't stay full with food for a long period of time, it doesn't rot, it doesn't lead to reflux, and it starts to help your body to digest things. By the way, you should never, ever, ever drink liquids when you eat foods. I know this is crazy, isn't it? Because every time you eat, you usually have your plate and then you have a drink that you're gonna drink while you're eating. The reason you don't wanna do that is if you drink liquids while you're eating, you are diluting your own stomach acids and stomach juices. You should drink warm water, maybe a cup or two, before you eat to sort of stimulate the stomach and get the juices and the acids being produced. And you should never drink cold beverages while you eat foods because cold will shut off acid production and it also causes a dilution of the stomach acids. That can help a lot. Next question says, what is the deal with alkaline water? A friend of mine told me about this packet you can tear open and pour into water to alkalinize it. Is that helpful? So here we go. This is going to open a huge can of worms because we have to talk about what is alkaline water and then we have to talk about the different methods of alkalinizing water. So first of all, alkaline water is simply water that the pH is above 7.0. On an alkaline scale, 7 is neutral, anything less than 7 is acidic, and anything greater than 7 is alkaline. Now, when you look at the numbers, it's kind of important because if 7 is neutral, then 8 is 10 times more alkaline, 9 is 100 times more alkaline, 10 is 1,000 times more alkaline, it's an exponential scale. So to drink a pH water that's at 7.4 or 8 or 9 has a much bigger different effect on the body than drinking, say, something at neutral or even drinking things that are acidic. The reason that most damage comes from drinking acidic food products like Cokes and beers and alcohols is because the acids accumulate within the body. They can cause arthritic pains within the joints. They cause an, an acidification of the body and it attracts free radicals, oxidation, and we tend to find a lot of cancers hang out in acidic areas. So this entire sort of alkaline movement comes from some research that was done back in the 30s and 40s that found out that cancer lives in an acidic environment and it cannot live in an alkaline environment. So they came up with this process known as the alkaline diet or the alkalinization of the human body. Well, here we are today, and we have technology, and we have the ability to change the pH of water. Now, when you're talking about these packets that you tear open and you pour in and stir around and poof, all of a sudden it's now alkaline water, you have to understand, you can take water and put baking soda in it and make it alkaline. You can take water and put calcium in it and make it alkaline, because calcium is a basic molecule. You can take water and run it through an electrical current and make it become alkaline. To look at the pH of the water in just that alone and not figure out how the pH got there is the same as looking at your weight and only focusing on the number rather than is it fat or protein or muscle or water. So the analogy would be this. I can weigh 200 pounds and be 4% body fat and be pure muscle, which would be fantastic, or I can weigh 200 pounds and be 60% fat and be horrible. The weight is the same, how it's composed is the issue. So let's look at it this way. The pH could be 7.0 or 8 or 9 using minerals, which is what most of those packets are. We pour a bunch of minerals in the water, we stir it around, now it's at, say, 8. Or we can alkalinize it using electricity and it's at 8. The pH is the same, but the process is what is important. Here's the thing. Most of the research that has been done on alkalinized water is done on what's called electrically ionized water meaning they're running water across these plates that hit an electrical charge and polarize and change the water's pH by creating a disruption within some of the polarization of the water. When you do this, you actually increase something called ORP, or the oxidation reduction potential of the water. That is important because all of the studies that show alkalinized water is helpful is actually because the higher the pH, 8, 8.5, 9, 9.5, 10, is increasing the oxidation reduction potential of the water. 
when you pour a small mineral pack into water and you increase the pH with minerals, you're not changing the oxidation reduction potential at all. So basically, it's like putting baking soda in the water, stirring it, and drinking it. Helpful because the pH has gone up, but it's not changing the ORP of the water at all. When you run water through an ionization machine, they, they term this kind of like electrolyzed water or Kangen water, whatever you want to call it. You're basically increasing the pH using electrical charge, but you're changing the oxidation reduction potential. The higher the ORP, the more the water acts like an antioxidant, which is important because when you're in a low pH state, if you're acidic, you're highly oxidized. So we drink this alkalinized, electrolyzed water because we want the oxidation reduction potential, not per se we want the pH. So again, I told you this is going to open a can of worms because the pH is basically meaningless. It's the oxidation reduction potential that you want to look for. And of course, you have to buy this really expensive machine that tells you the ORP levels. So let's look at it this way. What would be the best way to alkalinize the human body? You can drink alkaline water, but I'm not a big fan of using it all the time because it's sort of um, being forced to become alkalinized. So what are naturally occurring alkaline items that we can use? Well, anything that's green is going to alkalinize your body. So you can eat the plants, you can juice the plants, you can drink the juice of those plants. You can even dehydrate them, put them into a powder, and stir that into water, like a greens mix, and create an alkalinized green drink. And I love that as opposed to using these mineral-based alkalinizing agents. Important thing with doing any sort of alkalinization is two things. Don't drink alkaline water when you eat because what do we not we don't want to neutralize our stomach acids and also remember you shouldn't really drink alkaline water on a regular basis all the time because you need to check your pH so don't just do it for the sake of doing it find out if you are acidic or not you can go to vitamin shop and buy a very small pH test kit for about 10 or 15 dollars and you can in the morning check your saliva pH and check your urine pH and if you're running alkaline, there's no need to continue to alkalinize because your body's going to take care of itself. Next question says, there's a burning sensation in my arms and legs and lots of bruising showing up out of nowhere. What's going on? Okay, so first of all, burning sensations can come from a lot of different things. So I'm going to read a list and we're going to see maybe if something rings true with you. Shingles starting to express itself. Shingles is a virus that lives in your nerve system and as it starts to go down a peripheral nerve, it starts to burn and tingle. You may not necessarily have the bumps or the rashes yet, but the beginning stages of the shingles can come with a burning sensation. If it's your arms and your legs though, it's probably not shingles because it's usually just on one nerve root. Neuralgia or nerve pain, it's a big one. Sciatica would be burning down the legs, so it's possible that you may have some sciatica. Bulging discs either in the neck or the back because as a disc bulges, it can hit the nerve, which can cause neuralgia, or it can hit the spinal cord, which can cause neurological pain. Another big one is MS. And unfortunately, with both arms and legs going burning, I'm leaning towards MS because that's a classic sign of multiple sclerosis. Peripheral vascular disease, losing oxygen because the arteries are not flowing blood to the extremities can also cause a burning sensation. So can something called centralized pain syndrome, anemia, guys, it just goes on and on and on. So when we're talking about what could be causing this, this is a condition that really needs to be tested and investigated. But I do want to talk about the bruising for a moment. When you sort of like um, bump into something and bruise and you're an easy bruiser, that is a classic sign of two vitamins being deficient within your body. Number one, vitamin K, and number two, vitamin C. Vitamin K comes from all green leafy vegetables. The challenge with vitamin K, though, is you have bacteria in your intestines that are supposed to naturally produce vitamin K. If you're somebody who has taken a lot of antibiotics, like a lot of us, listen, when I was a kid, it was not uncommon to have that little pink mix that tasted like you know, bubble gum in my refrigerator. And my parents would always say, if you're not feeling well, just take a swig. Okay? I was raised in the antibiotic era, and chances are you were too. We now know that tons of antibiotics kill your bacteria in your intestines, and since bacteria in the intestines produce vitamin K, a lot of us are vitamin K deficient. If you're somebody who just bumps into the wall and you bruise, you're probably vitamin K deficient. So start taking more leafy green vegetables. Vitamin C also does that because vitamin C holds capillaries together. When you get a bruise from being bumped, it's often just a sign that you broke capillaries open. 
So if these bruises are showing up out of nowhere, it's probably from your day-to-day -day activity, walking, sitting, sleeping, bending, twisting, breaking capillaries open, causing a bruising effect. And so it could be that you may be vitamin C deficient. In addition though, this nerve thing that's going on in both arms and legs worries me as a physician because it means something neurological could be happening or you may be severely deficient in vitamins, minerals, or nutrients. So if you're dealing with that, it's time to get tested. There's some information below on how you can potentially do a consultation with us if you want. It doesn't matter if you're not here in North Carolina, we work with people across the entire US. Next question says, um, will you do a show on smoking cessation? Yes. How about we do it this Saturday? That'd be a great one. So join me this Saturday, 10 a.m. here in Charlotte on 1660 and 3 o'clock on WBT, which is 1110 a.m. or 99.3 FM, and I'll do an entire show on how to stop smoking naturally. This would be one for you if you're a smoker or one for your family members, your loved ones, or anybody you know that smokes because we're gonna go over some natural methods to how to stop smoking. Right here, though, I wanna give you guys a little fun fact. The um, University of Thailand and their medical association did a study where they took 100 people that smoked that said they wanted to stop. And that's the number one most important thing. You have to want to quit if you're gonna go through this path. But they took these 100 people and they broke them into two groups. This group, they said, when you want to have a cigarette, chew this kind of like nicotine gum and see if that helps to hold you off with the desires of having to have a cigarette. The other group, they said, we just want you to try this as crazy as it sounds, drink two to four ounces of freshly squeezed lime juice, which we will give to you. So they took the two groups and they said, off you go. Within nine to 12 weeks, they found that both groups had decreased their smoking amounts in the same effect. So the nicotine gums worked, the lime juice worked. They also discovered that the group that was drinking the lime juice had low to zero nicotine in their body. Of course, the ones who were taking the nicotine gum still had nicotine in their body because they were chewing the gum that has nicotine. Second thing they noticed was that the carbon monoxide, that's the poisonous gas that comes off of cigarettes that combines to hemoglobin and prevents oxygen from um, a binding, which is why a lot of smokers have difficulty taking good breaths and getting oxygenated. The carbon monoxide levels in the lime juice group was completely back to normal. The carbon monoxide levels in the nicotine group was almost back to normal. So the conclusion was lime juice works just as good or better than these nicotine gums. And the thing with the nicotine gums is they do work, but they're extremely expensive. And so you're looking at you know, 30, 40, $50 for a box and you have to have several of them throughout the month and you have to dose yourself down. Limes cost maybe like um, a couple dollars for a bag of 10 or 15 of them and um, they work just as good. So maybe a little trick that you guys can try. The next time you feel like taking a cigarette, drink two to four ounces of lime juice. Next question says, can animals consume coconut oil? Yes, and listen, in fact, a lot of animals love it. So we interviewed um, the Davidson Veterinarian Clinic, which is a holistic vet in, in Davidson on our radio show a couple weeks ago. So I want you guys to go back to my podcast. It's um, iTunes and then type in the phrase, Ask Dr. Ernst and look for our veterinarian interview episode that we did, I think it was in May, and, and listen to it. She's got some great information in regards to how to help your vets heal naturally. One thing that we talk about is that pets can consume the same foods as humans do when it comes to healthy food items. Most pets, so dogs and cats, will actually love coconut oil. They'll eat it like, like it's candy. So it'll do two things. Number one, it helps to increase their good fats. Number two, it usually helps to clear out coat issues. So if they're having like you know, skin reactions or sort of like their, their coat is not very lustrous, you can give them this fat and you'll start to see the shine and the shimmer and the smoothness of their coat come back. Number three is it can do the same thing that it does for us. It's antiviral, antibacterial, and antimicrobial. So of course it's, of course it's a really good nutrient to give your pets. The suggestion is not going more than a tablespoon depending upon how much they weigh. If you've got a really big dog and they're in the 100 plus, then of course you can give them more. But most dogs can consume about one tablespoon per day. It's really good to mix into their food. Now I want to answer another question that's kind of related to this, but you didn't necessarily ask this, which is this. If you have a pet that is having some sort of a health issue, like maybe they have diabetes or they have something going on or they're sick or you know, we're finding dogs now have cancer and things to this effect. 
you can actually do the same thing that we recommend for your health from a nutritional level with your pets. Step number one is getting rid of all grains. And, and I hate to say it, but every single dry pet food is generally a wheat, a corn, or a soy based. So we usually suggest cutting all forms of dry pet food. Number two, we want to get rid of the kind of wet pet foods. They're, they're often high in sugar and they got a lot of gravies and things to this effect. So there's no canned and there's no dried pet food. So what do you feed them then? Well, you can feed them carrots and celery and lettuce and vegetables. They love it. You can also get them raw dog food, which is usually just ground up meats into some sort of like a, a tube or a paste or something to that effect that you can cut and give to them. They're usually frozen and you have to defrost them and give them to your animals. But the last thing I want to tell you guys about your pets is you can fast them and they respond very, very quickly to it. Remember, they're a, they're a breed or they come from a form of like basically wild animals. And in the wild, most animals will, will eat and then they won't eat for a period of time and then they'll eat when they catch something. When we have domesticated dogs and cats, we put them on our feeding schedule. You're going to have breakfast, you're going to have lunch, you're going to have dinner. And this is partly why so many of our pets get sick. Personally, I have a dog that went through almost a point of dying. She's about 16 years old and was literally falling apart, vomiting left and right, couldn't hold urine in. We thought it was just because of her age. And when we went to the holistic vet, they said, well, listen, why don't you just fast your dog and see what happens? So we only fed her once per day and we only gave her raw dog food. We also gave her carrots and celery and spinach and things to that effect. And within as little as two weeks, she bounced back completely. Now she's literally jumping, barking, running, playing. And guys, she's 17 and acting like she's two years old. So you can do this with your pets. Next question says, I'm a flight attendant and I'm always in the airport or on an airplane. How do I stay healthy on the go? This is a tough one. And it's not just if you're a flight attendant, it's somebody who travels a lot or it's somebody who does things like, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a driver or you know, I'm working in an area where I have to, uh, have poor access to foods and things to that effect. But to answer the question for a flight attendant, it's hard because every single airport generally has food that is not healthy at all. The nice thing about Charlotte is we have this sort of like newer market right in between the A and the B gate that basically now sells things like avocados and they have even some cheese and things to this effect. So the best bet I can say for you or for anybody who works and travels a lot is you have to become smart with bringing your own lunches. As I've mentioned before, one of my most favorite foods to ever have is a block of raw cheese, one or two avocados, maybe some cut up celery and carrots, a handful of almonds, walnuts, pecans, pistachios, maybe some seeds like pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, that thing, and eat mostly that stuff. You're staying in the cellular healing diet, but they're very easy to carry with you and they fill up very, very fast and they're loaded with lots of good fats. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I love these questions. Make sure you keep them coming. So use the uh, question answer portal below to submit them. And don't forget, check us out this Saturday, 10 a.m. on 1660, 3 p.m. on 1110 a.m. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks so much.